Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for logging on to today's webinar, Work Addiction, the Most Glorified Addiction Hiding in Plain Sight. My name is Marla Kaufman, and I'm the Communication and Health Promotion Coordinator at IRETA. I'll be moderating our webinar today. I would like to go over some quick housekeeping items about how to use the WebEx technology and how to access continuing education credits. First, we would like to encourage you all to participate in today's webinar via two methods. If you have questions for our presenter or are experiencing any technical issues, please use either the chat function or the Q&A panel to communicate your questions. Our presenter, Dr. Lauren Broyles, is going to answer questions periodically throughout the presentation and then again at the end. So feel free to submit questions at any time and we will relay them to her. Again, you can submit questions anytime throughout the webinar using the chat function or the Q&A panel. This webinar is approved for one and a half PCB and or NADAC credits, which are free. And you can also request a general certificate of attendance at no charge. Please take note that it will take up to 48 hours for your CEUs to be available in your My IRETA profile because we have to cross check your attendance on the webinar. After the webinar, you will receive several follow up emails. The first will be an email with a link to the evaluation. The second will have information on how to access your certificate of attendance and continuing education credits through your My IRETA account. We may send you an additional email to remind you of the evaluation. I would now like to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Lauren Broyles. Dr. Lauren Broyles started her career at the University of Maryland Medical System in Baltimore, where she was a med surge staff nurse specializing with HIV AIDS and a nurse on the substance abuse consultation liaison service. After completing her PhD and a two year postdoctoral fellowship, she served as a research health scientist at the Center for Health Equity Research and Promotion at the VA Pittsburgh Healthcare System. Her research there centered on the efficacy and impl implementation of ESPERT and other alcohol risk reduction interventions in general medical, se general medical settings. At that time, she also served as an assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh with appointments in general internal medicine, clinical and translational science and nursing. Additionally, at the VA, she served as a site director and national coordinating center director for the Advanced Interprofessional Fellowship in Addiction Treatment. She has served as a member of federal grant review panels and as an associate editor for the journal Substance Abuse. In 2016, Dr. Broyles left academia and began working full time as a consultant training and coaching other re researchers in how to write successful grant proposals to the NIH, National, National Science Foundation, and USDA. Okay, Dr. Broyles, if you're ready, I will hand things over to you. Thank you, I appreciate that introduction. Give me just one second to bring up my screen share. There we go. Okay, thank you. Um, just as a reminder too, as well, we have some thunderstorms moving through Pittsburgh right now. So fingers crossed that they won't interrupt our webinar, but if for some, some reason something glitchy happens, that's why. Otherwise, um, let's go ahead and get started. You know, when I first started becoming aware that work addiction was an issue for me, and honestly, probably my primary addiction um, instead of alcohol, and I started poking around on the web, I noticed that depictions of work addiction were usually this kind of cartoon or clip art. And they capture the idea certainly, but the reality is that no one has four arms or five legs or a pack of papers and electronics stacked on their back. And so if you're like me, this kind of made it easier for the whole idea to never really hit home. It was easier for me to kind of blow it off and just not identify. But I think that the reality is that work addiction looks a lot more like this or this or maybe this, maybe like this woman or this one or this couple, maybe this guy or this woman on the right, or maybe this household. And to me, these feel really different 
they feel uncomfortable because I never had four arms or five legs, but I definitely was the guy with the bottle of alcohol. I definitely was the woman on the raft on vacation. And I definitely was the guy sitting up in bed working in the dark after my spouse went to sleep. And I'm guessing that one of the reasons that you all might be here today is that there's a little nudging that maybe a family member or a friend, a client or a patient, or maybe even yourself is some of what you see in these pictures as well. So I'd like to get a sense of where you are with respect to this topic. And I have some poll questions that Marla's going to queue for us. Um, there are three, just to get a sense of where you're at. And these will appear in the Q&A box. So just remember there are three. Go ahead and do all of those. The first one is what prompted your interest in today's webinar? The second one is how familiar are you with the concept of work addiction? And the third is what are your thoughts about work addiction? And just so you know, there are three poll questions. So if you don't see all three, be sure to scroll down. I know on some people's screens, the scroll bar might be hard to see. And Marla, can you let us know when the when the polling stops or closes? Sure, we still have about 13 people who have it in progress, so we'll give it about another minute or so. Okay. All right, I will share those results now. Okay, so it looks like people are interested, the majority of folks are interested in learning more about work addiction in general. And it looks like some people have concerns about friend or family member or themselves. People know a little bit or have heard about it, but they're not sure if it's a thing per se. It's actually an addiction. And then it looks like, I'm just having trouble enlarging that window there for a second. Okay, that it's an addiction and addiction addictive process. And nobody chose other. Okay, all right, thank you, that's great. That helps give me a little bit of a sense of where everybody is. Um, I'm really excited that all of you are here because um, I don't think that there are a lot of forums for talking about work addiction, even in other recovery circles or groups. And I think a lot of people are reluctant to talk about work addiction or maybe even think about it. Today's webinar is going to be interactive. We're going to do um, some self-assessments. We're going to do some practical exercises. And along the way, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of my own experiences at the intersection of recovery from both alcohol use disorder and work addiction. My orientation for today though is to really just have um, a primer or an overview. The goal is to really get these concepts out on the table and onto our radar, especially in the, the addiction community where we may be prioritizing um, some of the more life-threatening, immediately life-threatening addictions um, in our patients or clients. And I also want to try to gently turn the lens or the, the looking glass a little bit back up onto ourselves so that we can think about our own tendencies and our own patterns and relationships to work. I'm also going to be operating out of a framework that is conceptualizing work addiction on a continuum or a spectrum, just you know, very similarly to how, for example, we think about the spectrum of alcohol use disorders and ranging from 
risky or hazardous drinking, all the way through to severe alcohol use disorder. Um, and so even though somebody might not score high formally on one of the um, work addiction assessment tools that I'm going to talk about later, there might still be those unhealthy patterns or tendencies or risk factors, things that we still want to potentially pay attention to. So just a little bit about my story. Um, if after today you're interested in hearing a little bit more, um, I talked about the intersection of my recovery from work addiction and alcohol addiction on a podcast earlier this year, and you can check that out. But in short, I've traditionally defined myself, um, thought about my life in terms of an alphabet soup of academic degrees and programs and fellowships and so on. And the goal was always to reach higher and higher on the next level of the ladder to get, grab the next challenge or experience or grant or award or position or title. And so my experience in academia was really shaped by running on this hamster wheel where I was exhausted, but collecting all of these achievements and accolades and awards was pretty normal. At least a lot of the people around me, most of the people around me were doing the same thing. And yet work was all that I ever thought about, did, talked about, worried about. And if I'm honest, I really had very few friends, particular close friends, particularly outside of academia. And um, I'm still, you know, working through some shame about how I didn't prioritize my marriage or my two children at the time. I was pretty resentful and angry and overwhelmed and filled with anxiety. But on paper, I was like performing um, at this really high level and, and looking really good on paper. And from about 2010 to 2016, my drinking was gradually escalating as I was trying to manage and calm down all of those emotions and to be a wife and a mother and so on. And so my last year in academia was 2015 and my drinking was still increasing, but I was also doing a lot of soul searching about what I was going to do after my special career development award. And I realized that I didn't want to stay in the world, in this world any longer. I could do it, but I didn't want to. And for a variety of reasons, I'd have to be working even harder. So in January of 2016, I left academia and I started working in the private sector as a consultant for writing um, successful grant proposals. Getting out of that academic culture and hamster wheel helped me a lot, but my drinking still continued um, to get worse even after I left. And it wasn't until November of 2016 that, that I got sober. So recovering from alcohol use disorder had, I guess, serendipitously or grace, I'm not sure what you want to call it, um, healed a lot of that work-related overwhelm and resentments and anxiety. But I've still had a lot of professional identity struggles. Like, I'm not a researcher anymore. Who's my tribe? What's my big contribution or impact going to be now? And somewhere I had heard about work addiction, but I was still really in the midst of focused on working a recovery program for alcohol. So it's only really been in the last two years or so that I started questioning why I was still having all of these like professional identity issues about self-worth and achievement and, and all of that. And I came across work addiction again. And this time at this point in my recovery, I'm able to look at it with a different, look at these issues with a different lens. So I'm gonna share more about my experience later during the webinar. And I'm also going to be using a lot of information from this book on the left called Chain to the Desk, which is by Dr. Brian Robinson at UNC Charlotte. And I'm also going to be using some information and context from the Workaholics Anonymous um, Book of Recovery. I'm also going to be referring to a lot of these articles by these authors. Um, they and their respective teams have really been at the forefront of a lot of the formal research on work addiction. And so I wanted to give a nod to that as well. There has certainly been a lot of attention to um, overwork, busyness, and even the notion of workaholism for a while now. So some of these mainstream articles or sources may have caught your attention really over the past 10 years or so. But we've seen a resurgence lately. So if you look at the dates on these, you notice that they're from last summer. A lot of this is probably in response to the COVID-19 um, pandemic because it's caused more attention to 
our work stress in general and its impact on our mental health and our, our well being overall. Stress that's directly related to losing work or experiencing financial stressors around being cut back or maybe overloaded with more work. Stress related to working from home, trying to figure out technology or roles or tasks or managing children in the background. Expectations around how available are we supposed to be? What's that line, unclear line between when the workday starts and ends, or am I supposed to be available 24 seven via email or via technology? And all of that has created these blurred lines where we've started to question again, what our work patterns um, are saying about us as a culture. And lately people have even been directly challenging this culture of overwork where we have busyness and endless hours being things that people um, kind of wear as this badge of honor or a, a status symbol. So I've put a couple terms out there and concepts so far, and there are more, but for the most part, these four terms are, they can be considered synonyms. I'm going to pre predominantly use the first one, work addiction. Some of my earlier work and scholarship was on inadvertent bias and stigma around the language choices that we use with respect to addiction. And so for the most part, I'm going to use first person language here, meaning person with a work addiction as opposed to work addict or workaholic. There are times where you might hear me say work, workaholism, especially if I'm referring to the research or um, literature or, of course, Workaholics Anonymous. So let's go ahead and dive in. I'm going to define work addiction, get into how it's both an activity and a substance addiction, and then do a brief overview of the neurobiology. And we're also going to get into delineating between work addiction from just working hard or being an engaged worker. So first, in Chain to the Desk, which I'm going to refer to a lot here, Dr. Robinson refers to workaholism or work addiction as the best dressed of all the addictions and um, certainly the most accept socially acceptable and even rewarded. He also says that this whole ethos is really enabled by our culture's immersion at, um, you know, at the feet of overwork, which you can kind of compare to these blindfolded dolphins. Um, he uses a phrase a lot talking about how we just can't even see the water that we're swimming in because um, it's just such a part of the, the ethos of um, what Western culture, in particular Americans, um, are immersed in. But the term workaholic actually started um, in 1971. It was developed by a pastoral counselor named Dr. Wayne Oates, and he defined it as the uncontrollable need to work incessantly. And he was drawing parallels between the compulsive behavior that he was observing around work and the compulsive behavior that you might see around a substance like alcohol use. Problem is that 50 years later, there still isn't a whole lot of consensus on what constitutes workaholism or work addiction. Here are two general definitions um, that I like. The first is by um, Cecily Andreessen, who's one of the researchers that I mentioned earlier, and the second is Dr. Brian Robinson. And there are some similar features across the two. I know this slide here may hurt your eyes, but I wanted to highlight what some of the common themes were. First, in both, there's this common theme of overdoing, meaning overdoing in terms of effort or energy or time. And then in yellow, there is this theme of loss of control. And then in green, we see an impact or crowding out of other aspects or parts of life. So you can also kind of think about that as like negative consequences. What's different is in Dr. Robinson's definition, the pink part. First is um, this notion of OCD um, kind of suggests that there's this element, again, of uncontrollable but recurring thoughts or obsessions and then behaviors or compulsions that a person feels this urge to do over and over again. And he says that the frantic work habits of workaholics are what activate that stress response and that their neurological systems are on this constant kind of red alert, you know, amped up. So you get some temporary relief from the distraction of work, but when the underlying emotions or feelings or issues aren't addressed, then you have to keep working or working more, piling your plate higher or working longer in order to keep those feelings or those smoldering coals, so to speak, from turning into, into wildfires. The second part of the pink um, element is this self-imposed demands. 
In other words, the internal as opposed to the external um, demands, and they aren't always congruent with the reality of what the professional situation is expecting or even asking. So the true amount of time needed or the volume or the urgency of the work or the importance of the activities might be distorted or have been kind of reshaped by the person's own beliefs or patterns or perfectionism inside. And you know, in my own situation, one of the most humbling and uncomfortable and confusing parts of recovery has been really teasing apart exactly what was external pressures and what were internal or self-imposed demands. Um, what was being imposed upon me by my research center or my supervisors or my division and about what I should be doing or producing and what was really all a part of inside me. And there was a time where I would have said that it was all academia or all my bosses or my department. And I think a lot of those expectations were very real. Um, I was in an R1 research institution, but increasingly I've come to realize that at the same time, I also had these over the top expectations and standards for myself that were feeding and intersecting or overlapping with all of the external ones. So work addiction is simultaneously an activity or behavior overdoing work and also a substance, primarily adrenaline addiction in the same way that cocaine or alcohol create a chemical or substance addiction. And Dr. Robinson refers to this as um, a neurophysiological cocktail of adrenaline and cortisol. And studies have linked work addiction to the release of adrenaline in the body. Adrenaline is a hormone, it's produced by the body during stress, and it has an effect that's similar to amphetamines or to speed. So it's part of the body's sympathetic nervous system. It's what prepares you for action. So it's what increases your breathing or your heart rate, it causes pupil dilation, um, raises your blood pressure. It's what gets you ready. These surges prepare you for that bite or flight kind of action. Um, when you're trying to respond to a threat. And some people with work addiction actually say that that rush or that surge that they feel, that energy that they, energy rush is an adrenaline high. And over time, a lot of people with work addiction need start to require like larger and larger doses of that, of that cocktail to keep that high going in the body. Some researchers even go so far as to say that people with work addiction unconsciously put themselves into stressful work situations, deadlines, overloading, piling their plate, their tasks, creating, you know, this overcommitment or these self-manufactured kinds of, of crises or urgencies um, to help get the body to start pumping out those chemicals. You can also think about it in terms of the sympathetic nervous system being powered by adrenaline, it's in essence the gas in the car that gets you, again, primed and ready to respond to that kind of a threat. The parasympathetic nervous system is the opposite. That's the rest and digest, or that's the brakes that puts the temper on, on the gas. When I was first learning about work addiction and I repeatedly came across this explanation of um, adrenaline addiction, it didn't really initially make sense to me because I was in recovery from alcohol use disorder and for lots of reasons, including family history, I had always thought of myself as a person who was addicted to a depressant, something to calm down my racing mind, my anxiety. Um, and so while I was certainly genetically primed um, and, and had trauma in my background and, um, and so on, my drinking didn't really become a problem until I was a postdoc and a mom of two young children. So I really thought that my primary addiction was to alcohol and that it had developed later in life in response to stress in those different um, areas of my life. But I've come to understand that for me, I had two addictions. I had work addiction as my primary addiction, which revved me up to achieve and achieve and achieve and accumulate achievements and accolades and awards and degrees. And then a companion addiction to alcohol that was putting the brakes on, um, or at least trying to put the brakes on all of that revved up. So the analogy doesn't work 100%, but in a lot of ways, it's kind of like the speedball where I'm trying to get that perfect balance between the stimulant effects of one thing and the depressant effects of another. 
The other humbling thing for me was to realize that I was also experiencing withdrawal. So for example, when I wasn't getting regular hits of achievements and accolades and awards, um, I didn't think I had enough going on. Um, maybe I only had one or two plates spinning instead of four or five or six, or I wasn't getting recognized or awarded enough or being selected for another position. I felt anxious. I felt depressed. I felt um, agitated and bad about myself for weeks or, or days. And what I would do was then start chasing additional grants or papers or positions or responsibilities or mentees to try to keep that agitation um, down. Some folks in Change to the Desk also um, describe it this way. I took my family on beach vacations, but I was always ready to get back to work. I took a computer on vacation and realized, um, and had my staff fax me, FedEx me charts. I rationalized I didn't want to return to work with a pile on my desk, but truth be told, working gave me a high and made me feel important and needed in ways that nothing else could. Work transcended everything. Another person says, I didn't need to use drugs because my bloodstream was manufacturing its own crystal meth. So again, the stimulant kind of um, effect that people are getting from the adrenaline. Based on his research and clinical practice, Dr. Robinson and his colleagues have developed um, a set of what they call red flags for work addiction, ways to start to see some of the water that we might be swimming in. And we could also think about these as, or as um, risk factors or defining characteristics. So the first one is rushing and hyper busyness. Um, this can look like trying to juggle two or three activities at a time, or it can also look like packing in too many meetings or appointments or shortchanging yourself on the amount of time needed for a project or an activity. It all gives you this sense of accomplishing more and kicks up that stress level, causing that adrenaline to start getting pumping. The second one is need to control. So when there are unpredictable situations or um, you know, delegating or sharing a workload with other people can create too much uncertainty and unpredictability and anxiety. So there's this sense of I'll do it solo or I'm going to over plan and over organize so that I have this sense of predictability and control and consistency that makes things feel safer. The third one is perfectionism. Um, this means having inhuman standards for yourself or for other people too, where there's just no wiggle room for errors needing to be perpetually striving not just to be better but to be best and judging yourself and again other people too with really really stringent um, yardsticks the fourth one is difficulty with intimacy and crumbling relationships so this can look like avoiding intimacy or relationships avoiding um, you know more quality communication and intimacy as well as things like forgetting or minimizing family rituals, celebrations, birthdays, that kind of thing. The fifth one is work binges. So this can appear again as like self-imposed deadlines and these frantic blasts of work activity where you go full court press in like fits and, and bursts or maybe working nonstop for hours or days and having just unrealistic timelines and demands about uh, needing to get that work done instead of spreading it out or pacing it a little bit more uh, reasonably. Restlessness and inability to relax. I alluded a little bit to that when I talked about um, you know, the ways that I experienced like withdrawal syndrome, um, feeling guilty or anxious or irritable or restless um, whenever you were being quote unquote non-productive might be that you see hobbies or relaxing as a waste of time. So you gotta keep moving, you gotta do more work when that can also manifest in terms of staying busy with housework or cleaning or errands or chores, just anything to keep moving, moving, moving. The next one is work transes and, transes and driving while working. This one I could really relate to. Um, Dr. Robinson describes what he calls work transes or brownouts as the equivalent of an alcohol blackout. And it might look like this, this full compulsive immersion in work and the next thing you know, three hours have gone by and you're not even really sure how you got to this tangent or what you've actually gotten ac accomplished or really how much time had passed at all. And that used to happen a lot to me. Another one is um, the way he talks about work trances is um, again, while driving. So. You're in this trance, you're consumed with thinking about work, um, and you might drive through stop, line, stop, stop signs or forget to signal changing lanes, that kind of thing. 
um, the seventh one or eighth one is impatience and irritability. So if you think about it, time is going to be the most precious commodity for somebody with work addiction. And so there's this real impatience and anger with delays, or interruptions, or any kind of waiting that has to happen. Number nine is self inadequacy. And I've touched on this one a number of ways um, so far too, that sense that work is the primary source of purpose and meaning and, um, and your worth as an individual. And then as soon as a project is done or an award is given, there's this emptiness or this restlessness again that needs to, um, that, that returns and you feel this need or compulsion to start producing or proving yourself again. And then the 10th one is self-neglect. Um, Primarily here, I'm talking about sleep, nutrition, exercise. These things seem, tend to be pretty low on the, um, on the list of importance for someone with work addiction. So people might overeat or not eat at all, they might chain smoke, overdo caffeine, get all revved up there, having trouble with insomnia, or just try to get by on a few hours of sleep. And self-neglect can also look like denying or ignoring physical symptoms that you're having, signs, um, of an illness or things that you need to get checked out with your healthcare provider. So I have an amalgamation and a blending of some quotes and ideas, again, from Change to the Desk that I think illustrate some of these flags or concepts and some of the underlying, underlying um, psychological you know, kind of mindsets. These first three are really around the theme of compulsive over-accomplishing and overdoing, overcompensating, trying to overcome that sense of self inadequacy, like a human doing instead of a human being. There's also kind of as, as an extension of those, um, a second theme of these unrealistic and self-imposed standards of like what's gonna count as a legitimate achievement or accomplishment. And that mindset around having to always reach higher and higher and shine brighter and brighter for other people, but also for yourself. And then finally, this theme of comparing yourself to others. You're either inferior, like a, a poser, that kind of imposter syndrome, or like the first quote, or this distorted sense, my power is flickering, there we go. Okay, I think I'm back. All right, looks like the storm is right overhead. So bear with me with those little interruptions and blips and hopefully we won't have um, a major blackout here, <laughs> speaking of blackouts. Um, or again, look like this distorted sense of superior superiority in those um, bottom two quotes there. We also see some resentment in that third one. So a lot of people ask, all right, well, what's the difference between work addiction and somebody just being a really hard worker or focused and engaged worker? Not everybody who works long hours or who periodically neglects their hobbies or their family has work addiction. You know, hard work is when you're starting a business or you're in grad school or you're starting a new job or maybe you're, um, trying to finish an important project or you're a single parent, you're working two jobs or more to try to keep your family afloat. These things are probably not work addiction because in these cases, people aren't using their jobs as an escape or a way to manage their emotions or, or self-regulate. Instead, for people with work addiction, work is satisfying this deeper inner kind of psychological need. And in most cases, people's loved ones or family are um, accusing them of some kind of neglect um, because they're not present due to their work habits, or people are using work to, again, escape from feelings or intimacy or some kind of, um, you know, other social rela relationships or connection. So in short, if you're truly addicted to work, your relationship with work is the central point of connection. It is the central relationship in your life um, that's similar to what you know the ways that some people describe food or alcohol or gambling or whatever as the primary addiction in the, or relationship um i meant to say in their life so the person with work addiction 
is experiencing a compulsion and a physical addiction. They have this single-minded focus on work that translates into some of the things here on the left. So long hours, crowding out family and friends, leisure activities and hobbies, they are typically not getting a whole lot of genuine enjoyment or joy out of work. They're, they're living to work, they're trying to prove themselves, they're competing with others, and um, they're really working to achieve, again, that self-management and regulation of, of bigger and more complex emotions. And while people may initially start out as high performers, um, as work addiction progresses, we often see people's productivity actually decrease because they just start to approach burnout and have too many plates spinning, um, too many orbits all going at once. Instead, some of the characteristics on the right of the hard worker, it's, it's the contrast to those. So we see that this is somebody who enjoys their work, is passionate about their work, and is internally motivated to, um, to achieve their professional goals. And they're, they're not just trying to prove themselves. They typically, um, they're trying to grow and improve and reach their own potential, not um, compete with others. They have this clearer sense of work-life balance and they're not using work at the exclusion of other activities or relationships. And so when they have this kind of balance, they're usually consistently strong performers. We've got some additional contrast here in the next 10 um, qualities or characteristics, um, things around, again, hours, sharing workload or delegating work with other people, being a team player, being able to say no, taking vacations, burnout, and um, that idea of being sneaky about doing work, um, you know, cramming it in on, on vacations or after hours when you've told your family that you'll, you know, spend time with them. And I think this last row is really the, the crux of it in a nutshell. So we, we focus again on this idea that the central relationship or, or point of meaning for the person with work addiction comes from work. Whereas for the hard worker, their personal meaning and satisfaction comes, it's multidimensional. It comes from more uh, greater fulfillment in other dimensions of their life as well. So let me pause there for a second and see what questions may have come in so far or what questions you have about um, any of the ideas that I've put on the table so far. So we have a few questions and comments. Um, I guess I will start with the comments first. Um, one person just says, I work in prevention and am always open to information on addiction for teaching to others. Um, someone said work addiction is encouraged and rewarded by many of the companies I've consulted with, and I am looking for better tools to address it. Yeah. Um, then, uh, our 1st question is. Bur is burnout. Could burnout be a consequence of work addiction? Absolutely, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, when I get a little bit further in the presentation and I'm talking about the rewards and then also the consequences of work addiction. So absolutely. All right, and then 1 last question um, at this point, and that is, is addiction to adrenaline connected to or associated with the athletes addiction to endorphins? You know what? That's a great question. I don't know, but let me jot that down. And do a little bit of, um, of poking around. And if I find an answer for you, I will ask um, Iretta to send that out in an email as a as part of the follow up. Um, that's a great question. I don't know about that connection. One um, thing and then, wanna, oh, I'm ooh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, um, one person uh, did just submit. They uh, mentioned that employers. In the past, employers have required them to multitask, and they were wondering what your thoughts on that were in relation Absolutely. to work addiction. So, one of the things that I'm going to talk about later is, um, you know, the focus here is going to be on some of the individual uh, kind of ideologies or um, also responses or things that we can do. But I do talk about the organizational culture and societal culture a little bit later in the webinar because. Um, those absolutely play a part, the organizational culture, expectations and patterns and 
the modeling that leadership does absolutely have an impact on this. And so I don't want it to look um, like I'm totally blaming the individual or saying that this is strictly an individual process. Just like any addiction, there are lots of societal and cultural factors that are also impacting and shaping this. And especially when you're in certain work um, industries or cultures or professions, I think that's even more amped up. Um, even individual organizations um, can have that what Dr. Robinson calls that toxic work culture. So he talks about that in the book, and I'm going to definitely talk about that a little bit more in the webinar. I'm glad you guys are thinking about that connection as well. All right, great. Uh, great comments and questions, everyone, so far. Um, yes, we can keep on going. Okay. So how many people are we talking about here? Um, well, the numbers in terms of who's affected by work addiction aren't great. The generally agreed upon estimate here is about 10% of the US population, and that's based on Steve Sussman's work from 2011. Um, he's the one that's done the most comprehensive work on prevalence estimates. So based on US prevalence estimates at that time, which again is 10 years ago, this translated to about 32.2 million people. And if you think about the way the technology has exploded in the last 10 years and the ways that it has increased, again, just culturally our expectations around productivity, availability, accessibility, and so on, we can only assume that this has probably increased. Another important thing to consider is how other factors like COVID and economic instability have potentially impacted the prevalence rates over the last 10 years. So again, everything from stress um, to concern about job stability, to the challenges of working from home, not having a clear sense of responsibilities or boundaries and that kind of thing. The prevalence rates here for women, uh, for high achieving women in this particular case, raise some interesting questions for me about the intersection between work addiction and sex or gender and work addiction and also race and ethnicity. So um, thinking about the role that things like needing to work twice as hard to be considered half as good, um, women and minorities often being valued or promoted less, facing unequal pay situations, facing erratic or less support from, say, manager or the organization, feeling pressure, particularly women, to figure out what the trade-offs are going to be between work and family, and just overall women and minorities feeling like they have to do everything right. Um, all of these things can also feed into work addiction, or at least prime you and, and um, exacerbate that. So if you're interested in this topic, um, there's a great podcast called In Recovery. It's with Dr. Um, Nziga uh, Harrison. And um, she has an episode on work addiction where she actually talks about this intersectionality and particularly on race. So I've included a link to that podcast episode at the end of the webinar in the resources and, and references um, list. So I do encourage you to check that out. And the next question is, all right, what about co-occurrence with other conditions or mental health issues? So the stats aren't great here either, but again, it's Sussman who has done this work and he estimates that about 20% of people with work addiction have a co-occurring addiction as well. So he and his team did a systematic review of 11 addictions and they reviewed 83 studies. One of those the criteria for evaluating the study, it had to have more than 500 people. Um, and they used these, did this, this meta-analysis and systematic review to look at um, general prevalence estimates for each of the addictions and then the co-occurrence. So let me walk you through this table. First of all, the dark blue here is the estimated prevalence rate of these addictions in the general population. The red box here in the corner is how to read the grid. So in other words, if we're gonna read across, like if cigarettes are at, uh, or if the person is smoking, then what's the percent of those people who also say use alcohol? So we've got the orange, let's start here. This depicts this notion that 20% of people with work addiction, so if work addiction, X percent have other addictions as well. The light blue though is where, um, so I'm sorry, we can think about the orange as being kind of work addiction is the primary addiction. The light blue is where we're going to consider work addiction as the secondary addiction. For example, among people with an eating disorder, an estimated 25% also have work addiction. 
or amidst people with internet addiction, an estimated 10% there in the green also have work addiction. Now here again, it's just important to remember that this paper is from 2011 and it's important to know that even though he looked at studies with 500 or more people per study, in some cases, these numbers are only based on just a handful of studies. So again, it's possible that the prevalence um, is actually being underestimated here. Dr. Cecily Anderson, who's again one of those um, active work addiction researchers that I mentioned, she and her team conducted a survey of over 16,000 people in Norway and had them complete work addiction scales, OCD scales, and addiction and depression uh, instruments also. Oh, and an ADHD scale. And in her study, workaholism was associated with ADHD, all of the OCD symptom measures, and with anxiety and depression. So how do we measure or determine whether someone has work addiction and how bad it is or how potentially affected they are? I'm going to do a quick run through of three formal tools, and then we'll go through a more informal uh, checklist type of quiz from Workaholics Anonymous. Now, there are a couple of issues here around the extent to which the formal questionnaires are theory driven or their reliability and validity, meaning whether the tests are measuring the same things in the same way or whether there's agreement or disagreement across tests and the stability of the scores if you take them um, to the same person, give them to the same person twice. I'm not gonna get into all of those issues. I just wanna give you a quick snapshot of what's out there. So I'm gonna start with the work addiction risk test. And this is based on Dr. Robinson's research. This is his instrument. It's not based on theory. It's based on symptoms reported um, by clinicians who were treating, in his case, he uh, uses the term workaholics. So there are 25 items across five different dimensions, and those are there on the left, um, in the left-hand column. And then you can see a sample item for each one on the right. And so the idea is that you rate each of these 25 items on a four-point scale, where you answer for yourself, or you know, is this um, never true, all the way through to always true. And then you calculate a score that ranges from 25 to 100, and there are there's a total score and then these dimension or basically subscale scores. There are several cut points. So the first um, cut point is um, basically 25 to 50, uh, 56. Um, that means like low risk for work addiction. 57 to 66 is moderately work addicted and anything higher than 67, 67 to 100 is highly work addicted. The next one is the Bergen work addiction scale, and this scale asks you to rate seven items responding to the question, how often in the last year have you, and then you can look at the items, some of the items, sample items there on the right hand column, have you done this particular thing? Um, this too has been psychometrically validated, just like Dr. Robinson's. Um, it also uses a Likert style kind of scale where you're marking um, how often in the last year this applies to you, ranging from never to always, and the scores range from 7 to 35. The scoring is a little bit tricky here. Um, if you have chosen often or always on at least four out of the seven items, then it um, designates you as being likely uh, a workaholic. You can see on the left here where we talk about the seven dimensions, this really overlays with DSM criteria for addiction. And then the last one that I wanna just touch upon is the work, workaholism battery or work bot. Here, um, this is also not based on theory, it's based on attributes from the literature and then the developer's own hypotheses. And it really conceptualizes workaholism in this uh, realm of kind of being an, uh, an obsessive compulsion, uh, obsession compulsion uh, kind of thing. It measures two different kinds of workaholism. They've got what they call non-enthusiastic uh, workaholics or real workaholics, and then enthusiastic workaholics. And it's got these three dimensions here, work involvement, work drive, and work enjoyment. And again, I've put a sample item on the right-hand side there. Work involvement is your psychological involvement with work. 
Work drive is your internal pressure to work. And then work enjoyment is the amount of satisfaction or gratification that you get from working. So you rate these on a five point scale too. sum them up again. There are these, these subtotals um, and the, the interpretation here is a little bit. Funny too, so you are a real workaholic or non enthusiastic workaholic. If you score above the mean on work and uh, involvement and work drive. So high on the 1st, 2 dimensions and low. On the 3rd, one, meaning. You're highly involved, you're highly driven, and you're not enjoying it. That's a real workaholic or a non enthusiastic workaholic in their terminology. On the other hand, you call you qualify as an enthusiastic workaholic if you're above the mean on all three of the subscales. Now there's some controversy here about these dimensions. Um, some people say that work enjoyment is irrelevant, um, but this too is fairly widely used, widely used and has also been validated. So what I'd like to do is try one of these. I'm going to ask us to try the wart. Um, do this on yourself, or you can do this based on your perceptions of a patient or client or a loved one. Marla is going to paste um, the link for the wart into the Q&A or the chat, so you can copy it right from there. And um, it's going to automatically score for you this particular version. The workaholics anonymous questions are what I'm going to ask you to go into once you've completed the wart. So write down whatever your wart, wart score was, and then go into the workaholics anonymous 20 questions. And this is similar to the checklist where you're just going to answer yes or no to those 20 questions and tally up the number of yes responses um, that you have. So I'm going to give you about five or six minutes. I'm going to set a little timer for us to complete both of these. Um, don't overthink. Um, just be as honest as you can, but moving through and then we'll spend about 5 minutes with some poll questions afterwards about where your score fell and what your reactions or thoughts are about that. So, Marla, can you paste those into um, the chat so people can click right into those and I'm going to set. A little timer for us. Yes, I have already posted the CNN link and I am posting the 20 questions right now. Okay. And those are in your chat box. So again, you can do this for yourself or you can do this um, through say an observation to a client that you're concerned about or a family member that you're concerned about. But it's probably gonna be most helpful um, to kind of take a look again at our own patterns and tendencies here.
Okay, so another two minutes or so to complete those assessments. Two, two and a half, two and a half minutes. So just remember the report will auto score for you, but jot your score down. And the Workaholics Anonymous 20 questions, you'll have to total up how many yeses you have. So one more minute. And you can always return to these uh, later on. Okay, so I'd like for you to do, and Marla, if you can cue now the questions, I'd like for sure. you to give us a sense of where your score fell on each one of these. And so there are two questions here pertaining to the wart. So where did you fall? Where did your total score fall on the wart? And if you could choose yours. And then what your thoughts are about those. If I didn't capture any of your thoughts, please feel free to check other and then share that in the Q&A. And then there are two questions about the Workaholics Anonymous, more informal kind of assessment. Um, how many items did you endorse with a yes? And then what your thoughts were on that. All right, we'll let this poll question up for a few minutes. And I've got some thunder and lightning, just letting you know, in case I zap out for some reason. All right, we still have a few folks who have it in progress, so we'll let them give it about a minute to wrap up. I'm getting a few um, 
chats that people don't see the poll. Um, if you if you look on your screen, there's probably a polling, a line that says polling. It might be minimized though. If you click the down arrow, it will open for you. I'll give it maybe about 60 more seconds. All right, here are the results. Okay, so it looks like we've got the majority of responses on the wart falling in that green section, um, but we do still have um, some pretty even distribution across the red and the yellow light sections. Um, people feel like it's spot on or it's pretty accurate, so that's good. I'm glad that at least in terms of kind of this first pass into intuition, um, it feels like it's capturing um, kind of what you know about yourself. Um, let's see, when we go to how many items did you endorse on the Workaholics Anonymous um, questionnaire, we've got, it looks like the majority of folks falling there in that three to eight zone. Um, and then um, maybe even we've got um, kind of folks in that next category up of that nine to 14, a couple people in the upper zone and a good number of folks um, down in the zero to two as well. And again, people um, seem to feel like it's pretty spot on and kind of accurately captures um, who they are. Were there any additional comments in the um, Q&A section, Marla? I guess I'm interested in hearing um, which one of these you guys thought was maybe more accurate or which ones you liked better. Uh, if we could just get a really quick sense of that. Sure. Um, or actually, you know what? I'm sorry, Marla. What I want to do, I'm just going to be mindful of time. How about if we save that at the end? And that can be okay. one of the questions we return to um, if there's a little bit more time. Sure. Okay, thanks. I was just checking out the time. Um, so thank you for doing that self-assessment. I hope that that gives you kind of a, a little bit of a shift in your lens as we move through the rest of the, the webinar. So, okay, where does workaholism come from? Uh, I want to talk about that. What the psychological or spiritual purposes are that it's serving, how it's related to your work environment or your culture, like in my case, academia or the organization that you may be working for or have worked for in the past. And I mentioned earlier that work addiction is probably the most socially acceptable or respectable or rewarded addiction. And so I want to get into exactly what do I mean by that? What are the rewards? And then are the consequences similar or different from other addictions? And then how is this impacting family and marital functioning? So we're going to look at all of these next. Like any addiction, work addiction is also multifactorial. So there are lots of contributing factors like we see up in the first category, individual factors around personality, dispositions, your own kind of work styles and patterns. And then the second cluster is really these home and family or sociocultural um, experiences that may have shaped us from earlier in life. So it could be anything from stress and trauma to what kind of modeling or vicarious learning you observed in the home, what your family or personal values are around like a work ethic, and then kind of what um, roles and responsibilities you maybe observed um, with your own family of origin. The second cluster is this behavioral reinforcement. So some of this is organizational and I'm gonna actually do a deep dive late uh, in a second on the next slide, but just kind of at the first surface level, we've got some of these intangible rewards. So we've got 
what I call the AAA, so achievements, accolades, and awards um, that are reinforcing the patterns and the behavior. Cultures where there's this winner take all kind of system where first place, whatever that is in terms of sales or you know achievements, gets all the attention and second place and below gets nothing. So it reinforces that you have to be top dog, so to speak, or the sole winner, whatever metaphorically, you know, whatever that means. And then an organizational environment that drives or promotes overwork. And this really needs its own slide because there are so many, and I think this might have been what two of the folks earlier were kind of referring to, um, a workplace culture that looks like this. And one of the reasons that I really like Brian Robinson's book is that he talks about clinicians, patients, families, you know, the person themselves, and he also talks about the workplace. He's got a whole chapter devoted to organizations, and there's another assessment that you can do of your own workplace called um, the addictive organization. I also want to spend a little bit of time quickly talking about a concept that Dr. Robinson um, talks a lot about with respect to the origins of workaholism. He talks about how in his research and clinical practice, he's found that a lot of people with work addiction um, have grown up in situations that were dominated by parental substance use disorder, mental health issues, or other problems that forced kids to take on responsibilities, emotional responsibilities, or physical responsibilities that were, um, were overwhelming, that they just didn't have the emotional scaffolding for. Um, and so situations where kids didn't feel like they had a lot of control and then sought control through schoolwork or church work or volunteer work, or then those, those same patterns get translated into, um, they bring those to their, to their adult job. So here's just a sample of some of those uh, parentifying kinds of events. And this definitely resonated for me as well with my own, um, my own childhood experience. Um, so, you know, this is this is arguably the most glorified addiction, again, the most socially acceptable, respectable, and it makes it really easy for us as a society to reward work addiction and to even overlook it in ourselves. So lots of the rewards here are unique to work addiction. I think it's really hard to come up with another addiction where you can collect these same social, interpersonal, and professional benefits as a direct result of the process itself. I think maybe you can make the case with, um, you know, because of our body, our society's obsession with thin, attractive bodies, you can make the case that maybe exercise or food addiction um, issues can generate some of these same social rewards. But overall, I think there's just this direct link here with work addiction that we don't see in others. And it can end up feeling like the golden handcuffs that I've got pictured here. And then the consequences start to mount. So we see all of the internal mental and emotional ones there in that first box, including burnout, which is what somebody asked about earlier health problems, family and marital conflict, conflict in the workplace with your subordinates or coworkers, and then even accidents or injuries, again, related primarily to driving, um, driving while texting, on calls, uh, just obsessed in a work trance, that kind of thing. And so I want to say a little bit more about this family experience with work addiction. This is something else that Dr. Robinson um, talks a lot about, but families feeling isolated, out of the loop, like they are just this sort of nice, pleasant backdrop where the, the real attention and relationship, again, from the person with work addiction is happening on a different stage. And so even when people are physically present, they're often not emotionally or mentally present. Um, they're jittery or anxious or, um, you know, sneaking in, um, trying to get work done. So again, Dr. Robinson is really, um, he devotes a lot of time to the experience of the spouse and also the experience of children. He looks at it from a real family dynamics kind of standpoint. So, how do we recover from all of this? Well, that's what I'm gonna talk about for the remaining um, 20 minutes that we've got together here. I wanna introduce some practical resources um, and strategies for abstinence and recovery and healing and also mindful working. Maybe you're not one of the people who's high on those, on those scales, but you're starting to say, oh, all right, well, doing these assessments made me think, I, you know, I, I have some tendencies or some risk factors this way. What might be some things that you want to look at? So whether you or your client or your family member or whoever, regardless of where you fall on that spectrum, 
if you're interested in changing your patterns or your relationship to work, I think that there are resources um, for you. The first thing I want to say about this is that recovery and healing or transitioning out of work addiction behaviors um, is, you know, it's got to be reconceptualized a little bit here because just like say food addiction, where you can't entirely abstain from eating, you have to think most of us can't thoroughly abstain from working. That would be nice, but we can't do that. So we have to think about what abstinence is going to look like in this kind of a context. Now, the majority of very general ideas that are out there are tips for managing work addiction are seemingly simple, practical strategies, and I personally use all of them. They take some time to really implement and they're just part of the basics. Now they are 100% necessary, but they're often insufficient because when the story or the recommendation stops here, it really misses, I think, the point that um, work addiction has you know, has this element of loss of control. It's not something as simple as just, um, you know, saying, well, you need to get your priorities straight or you need to have better time management. Um, this is really, depending on where somebody is on that spectrum, this may need to be a much deeper dive. The other thing that sticking with these kinds of orient, with just these tips and, and strategies does is that, again, it keeps the focus on work addiction as an individual problem with individual solutions. And so, yes, on the one hand, individuals need to take responsibility for their own issues and addiction, and we have control over the individual realm. That's where we have the greatest amount of control. Um, but at the same time, work addiction has a lot of implications for families and organizations and for us as a society. And there are also interventions or preventive strategies that could be happening at those levels. And that's probably a webinar for another day. I'm going to focus on the individual ones because, again, it's what we have the most control over and is probably good for um, the primer orientation of today's webinar. So where are we with this? All right. Um, I have to be honest, the research on work addiction. Um, its definition, its assessment, and especially its treatment is really in its infancy compared to what we have for other addictions. So there's virtually no research on the efficacy of different strategies for treatment of work addiction. Uh, so no evidence-based practices yet. But, um, you know, like we have with most addictions, it's going to be this multimodal kind of approach, which is what we do across the board. So first, there may need to be this treatment of an underlying mental health issue or a different addiction. But just as a quick snapshot, cognitive strategies, CBT, can be used to help change the mindset of the person around their work priorities or patterns. For example, challenging assumptions that um, I have to finish this project because nobody else can do it right, or I have to prove I'm better than other people, and then help replace those with more adaptive beliefs or attitudes. You can use motivational interviewing to also help people clarify what their goals are or change their relationship with work, help them resolve that tension or ambivalence um, and help figure out what some of the barriers are to change um, that matter most to that person. And also can involve providing some accurate feedback about how their behavior may be impacting um, others. Psychotherapy is primarily focused on the emotional roots, some of the underlying issues of around how work addiction developed in the first place. Um, looking at some of those underlying processes or behaviors like anger or shame or approval seeking um, that we really need to address in order to get to the heart of creating some long-term change. Marital and family counseling can also help examine the patterns of um, work addiction in the context of family dynamics. So acceptance, um, you know, by the spouse or, or enabling um, by the spouse that may have occurred in that marital dyad, addressing strained relationships, communication, um, and figuring out what realistic, um, you know, connect, reconnection and, and time of share, sharing time together is going to look like. Um, I also want to talk about um, mindfulness, which is something that Dr. Brian Robinson devotes a huge portion of his book to. He calls it mindful working and developing a mindful resilience zone for yourself. And the idea here is that for the person with work addiction, your brain is like Grand Central Station. You've got, it's just racing. There's no time to pause, catch your breath. You've got this frantic work, work pace, um, thinking about how you're going to complete the project, what you're doing next, what people are going to think. And these are all like out of the moment episodes. So they keep you primed in this stress soup kind of thing. They keep the adrenaline going. They're activating that sympathetic nervous system. 
And what we want to do is temper that by activating the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest. So most of you are probably pretty familiar with mindfulness, um, tuning into your senses, the breath, um, you're observing yourself, your thoughts, single tasking instead of multitasking. But I want to just quickly do a brief little exercise. Um, Dr. Robinson has a whole slew of them, which, which he calls micro chillers. So ways again to start applying the brakes and activating that parasympathetic nervous system and bring you back to the present moment. So um, I'm gonna provide you with some resources later, um, again, on his micro chillers from his website where you can, or YouTube channel where you can also um, practice some of these, but I'd like to take just about three minutes to do what he calls the butterfly hug exercise um, together. And I'm gonna lead you um, through this. And let me just kind of give us a timer here so I stay on track. Um, might feel a little bit silly at first, but nobody's, we can't see you. So definitely go ahead and do this. Um, what I want you to do first is think about a topic or an issue that's bothering you today. So preferably something that's kind of in its average zone instead of something that's um, really big, because this is our first time trying this. So maybe there's a project hanging over your head or an argument you had with a teenager. Um, maybe you have to have an uncomfortable conversation later on today. Maybe you're concerned about a patient or a family member. So take a second and think about that. And while you're doing it, I want you to cross your arms like this. And we're going to gently tap and flap our wings, so to speak. We're going to keep the wings going. I'll give you a second to think about the issue or topic that might be causing you some stress or anxiety. And now I want you to turn your head to the right and pick something in your field of view. And I want you to focus in on the details of it. I want you to look at it as if you're never, you've never looked at it before this closely. So take a look at the color and the color gradations. Keep tapping. The size, the texture, maybe the shadows the way that the light's hitting it. You don't have to memorize any of these details. I just want you to try to notice as many as possible. Keep your wings tapping. Take a couple more seconds here to try to notice, notice some things about this object. Okay, now I want you to turn to the left and do the same thing. Pick something in your field of view, even if this is a familiar environment. You're looking at color, texture, you might be counting the number of whatever's in a pattern or counting the shadows. What are you maybe noticing for the first time? Keep tapping, flapping the wings. Okay, we're gonna turn back to the right. I want you to pick a different object and do the same thing here. Really focusing on all the different characteristics that the thing is, maybe you've looked at a thousand times before. Color and texture, shape and size, what it might feel like to hold it, touch it, what the pressure in your hand might feel like. Keep the wings flapping. And we're going to go back to the left and pick one last final object and repeat that process. I'm looking at my briefcase. It's a familiar object, but I'm trying to look at it with completely new detail oriented eyes. I'm not memorizing anything about it, just noticing different things about it. Okay, let's come back to center. 
And so what I'd like for you to ask yourself is, okay, how do I feel? What am I aware of? And has there been any kind of a shift in terms of my level of worry or tension? Do I feel more calm or clear or still? Do you have to maybe remind yourself what the problem or issue was that you were initially thinking of? The goal here is to interrupt that red alert system that stays activated in your body or mind and bring you back to that present moment, away from being past oriented to what maybe happened this morning with your teenager or future oriented with what's going to happen later, that conversation you have to have with your boss to right now. And the idea is that with regular practice and you build these up over time, um, you build up that emotional resilience kind of muscle. So again, Dr. Robinson has a lot of these and I encourage you to check those out. Um, there's something you have to do and do often, but they really can help recenter you. I also want to talk about Workaholics Anonymous real quickly as another major resource. Um, it was started in 1983, so it's definitely one of the newer 12-step fellowships. Um, it has its own body of literature with its own um, quote-unquote big, big book there in yellow, as well as its uh, workbook and daily meditation guide. And you can see the 12 steps there, which have just basically been adapted, um, replacing you know, the word work um, in the place of, say, a substance. I'm going to assume that most of you have a familiarity with a familiarity with the 12 steps, so I'm not going to go into those. Um, but I do want to feature one of the Workaholics Anonymous tools that I think is really, really helpful, regardless of where you or your client or person you're concerned about fall on that spectrum. Um, you know, I said before that, um, you know, we have to reconceptualize abstinence here and what this is going to look like. So one of the tools in WA is this concept of bottom lines and top lines. And this is helpful for anybody who's thinking about changing their relationship to work. And it's personalized because different things are going to um, trigger these, these work addiction behaviors in different people. So bottom lines define the point at which we cross over into unhealthy or addictive behavior. We cross out of abstinence into work addiction or overwork more generally. So the first thing that I want you to do here is, you know, if we think about the 12 step concept of unmanageability, um, you're asked to create a list. Um, and actually, I think in the interest of time, unfortunately, we're not going to have time to do this, but I encourage you to do this later on on your own. Um, first, take two or three minutes and consider, all right, for me at a personal level, what are some of the, um, the unmanageable behaviors or risky things that I'm doing, so to speak, in this realm? Maybe I take bed to work a lot, or I'm working 60 hours a week, or I'm consistently late picking my child up from daycare because I keep working. And so you wanna list those first, and then you're gonna use those to create what they call bottom lines for yourself, lines that you're setting for yourself, um, where crossing over them might mean work addiction. So they can be phrased in terms of negative things like I do not statements, or they can be phrased in affirmative positive terms. So you can see some examples here. Maintaining these bottom lines, this is like, again, the minimum threshold of what you don't want to cross. You can create three or four of these for yourself that are really, again, the bottom line, what you don't cross. Top line behaviors represent our aspirations or our goals. These are things that we want to work towards. So once you build some success with the bottom lines, you want to then reach a little bit higher in terms of top lines. So for example, the person who establishes the bottom line of I'll work no more than six days a week might have a top line or a goal statement of I'll take two days off a week. Or the person who sets the bottom line of I'm going to spend 15 minutes in quiet time, prayer, and meditation every day might set a top line, companion top line of I'm going to take one day a month off to um, you know, participate in a personal meditation retreat kind of thing. So what I'd like for you to do later on is to think about what might be your bottom line things that you don't want to cross. And then what would the companion three or four top lines be that you want to reach for? 
Another way to think about this is in terms of what Dr. Robinson calls putting together a work moderation plan for yourself. And some of these things, you've probably seen this kind of an idea before that we've got this hub and we've got these four spokes of self, relationships, play and work. And the idea is how balanced are they? Do you have a nice smoothly running wheel or is something unbalanced and it's rickety? So that, in that sense, you've probably seen something like this kind of a tool before, but the interesting thing here is that you can use your Wart scores to help identify which areas you might need to create some more balance. So when you look at the pattern of scores or where you scored a three or a four indicating often or always, those can be clues about where you might need to make some modifications um, and devote some extra attention where the largest sets of gaps are. Some other practical strategies, I just want to return to these real quick. These are things that I talked about earlier, setting boundaries around work hours and number of hours. I've had to do this for myself, um, you know, say that I work between 8.30 and 4.30, that's it. I don't do email uh, after then, I don't do it on the weekends. Um, I've been able to do this because I've had a lot of autonomy in, in my current job. But I've also had to do number two, building in some time cushions around meetings or appointments and not just putting them in, but really honoring them and actually using them for mental breaks. I've had to also do things like, um, you know, again, thinking about meals, movement and sleep. So I actually pack myself a lunch each morning. I get up out of my office that I'm in right now. I eat it downstairs seated at the kitchen table. Um, all of those things are really important for me so that I'm not just plowing through and um, avoiding food and then binging later, which is what I used to do. And then you'll have to think about what your own idiosyncratic strategies might be for, you know, working with yourself. Um, for me, I literally set a 30 minute timer uh, when I'm working and I take a break after the third 30 minute cycle. That also helps me from going down the rabbit hole of brownouts, which were a really big part of my um, work addiction, just not realizing how much time had passed and really just having spun off into a tangent. That 30 minute timer, my phone is plugged in across the room, forces me to get up out of my chair every 30 minutes to turn it off. And it also cues me in to how much time has passed. And do I need to change the pace of my work? Do I need to speed up a little bit? Do I need to slow down a little bit? So whatever those idiosyncratic strategies are, that might work for you. If you are interested in doing a deeper dive, I have included some references and resources, some of the podcasts and articles and books that I've talked about today. And in closing, because I want to leave a couple minutes for questions, um, I want to leave you with these two thoughts that have really become personal mantras for me. The first one is your worth is not measured by your productivity. And the second is from Brene Brown. It's that it takes courage to say yes, to rest, and to play in a culture where exhaustion is seen as a status symbol. I'd say it not only takes courage, but it's really an act of, act of rebellion um, to say no to those things um, and then to say yes to rest or play um, instead. I'm still working on truly integrating these and like feeling them, you know, um, here in this, this internal level. But um, they do help ground me on a daily basis. And so I'm hoping that um, they'll also resonate with you or your loved ones or your, your patients or clients. And I wanna thank you for spending some time with me today to talk about this. Um, and I'm happy to take some questions. I'm happy to stick around um, for as long as you like to um, hear your comments or your thoughts. Uh, please put those into the Q&A. All right. Thank you so much, Lauren. This was such a great webinar. I learned a lot for sure. Um, but so we're getting lots of positive comments in um, lots of people saying how enlightening this was and how uh, much needed it has been for them, um, themselves and their families. Um, so, yeah, just lots of those coming in. Um, but we have some more specific questions as well. Um, one is just um, someone wanted to know what were the names of the three scales again? So we we had the wart, but they wanted to know what um, the other ones were as well. Sure. So there's the wart, which is the work addiction risk test. The Bergen, B-E-R-G-E-N, work addiction scale. The work bot, um, where it's B-A-T. Um, and I forget what that stands for. 
the BAT part. There's also the DUWAS, which is uh, the acronym is capital D U W A S. That's the Dutch work addiction scale. Um, there are a handful of others, but those are probably the top ones that are most widely used and have some degree, again, of psycho psychometric validation, those um, validity and reliability um, assessments. All right, great. And also, um, just as a reminder to everyone that's on, we will be sending out these slides as a PDF. So if you didn't happen to catch those or write them down, they'll be in the slides. Um, okay, so we have some other questions. Uh, one is, I often think of there being some emotional trauma underneath addiction. I am wondering if this holds up for work addiction, given the numbers that you displayed of women doctors, attorneys, psychologists, therapists, 23 to 25%, it doesn't seem to pan out. So they were wondering what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, that echoes the trauma part, echoes my own experience. Um, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole with that, but um, in terms of like parentification, in, in my case, um, I come from a single parent family where my father was was absent and my mother had breast cancer and she died when um, she was diagnosed when I was 11 and died when I was 19. So for my sister and I, there was absolutely a lot of parentification. So I can relate to that trauma element. Um, I do think your observation is entirely spot on. I think that we just don't have really great um, estimates on work addiction and they probably are underestimates. Um, Steve Sussman is the one that's done the most comprehensive work. Um, but I think that as a culture, we're even reluctant to talk about this, let alone recognize it potentially in ourselves. There aren't forums for talking about it, which is why I sincerely want to thank all of you for participating today, because I think it takes a lot of courage to even say, yeah, I want to learn more about this, or yeah, I think this might be me. But if we can't even have these kinds of conversations or, you know, webinars or people aren't interested, then really getting good solid estimates on what the prevalence is and what the overlay is with trauma or other mental health conditions or um, other health conditions, it's just preventing a lot of um, just getting really good numbers and then figuring out how as a culture or as a clinical realm, we want to respond to that. So it's, it's a point well taken and I think mm -hmm. it's not underestimated. One person uh, wrote in asking um, for your comments on work expectations and cultural demands, the drive to prove oneself in comparison to other cultural groups, racial dynamics and work addiction. Yeah, so a lot of that, um, a lot of the, the racial um, or the experience of folks from racial and ethnic minorities, I think mirrors. Um, I was trying to speak about both of those when I was talking about some of the gender um, dynamics as well, is that there is this sense of I've got to work twice as hard to be considered half as good or um, I need to, um, you know, I'm not, I don't get managerial support. Um, I have to work harder to prove myself to my colleagues, not only to my superiors. Um, I'm facing these unequal, unequal pay situations where I'm working harder to try to get a, get the evaluation that I deserve in order to then get the merit increase that I think I, I, I deserve as well. And so all of those things, um, really come into play, especially when there's also explicit bias or discrimination. You might feel like you have to work even harder to overcome that and um, and prove yourself. I think Dr. Nzinga's uh, Harrison's um, podcast again does a really great job um, talking about this, and she's a woman of color as well, so she um, speaks with a lot of um, personal experience and, and authority in that area. So I would encourage you to check out that webinar. That or sorry, that is back. Close that out. Um, that is back on her. Um, Sorry, it's in the resources section that I included. Great, and uh, you'll be able to see those when we send out the slides. Um, we just have a few more questions. You said you don't mind sticking around a little yeah, after. I'm happy to okay. Stick around. Um, one person wrote in. This is more of a comment, but um, you might have a you might have some thoughts on it. Someone said a relative of theirs has a full time office manager position and also works three nights a week at two places waitressing. And the topic of conversation is always how much money she makes and she wears her manager work badge when not at work. And she has had to have a triple bypass 
at age 45 10 years ago and they said that they were worried about her their relative yeah there are lots of health problems that are um, related to work addiction so cardiovascular disease depression um, diabetes a lot of these are related because if you think about the fact that your body is literally swimming in those stress hormones 24 7 um, and also that you might be neglecting eating well getting good exercise getting enough sleep and maybe ignoring physical health symptoms, all of those factors together can really, really be create this life threatening situation. And so while we may not think, oh, yeah, work addiction, you know, take care of your addictions in the order in which they're killing you. For some people, this may, in fact, be that primary addiction um, or it may be a secondary addiction that, you know, like in my case, where I kind of took care of the first one. And then this was the second one actually for me turned out to be the primary. But um, I. I, that that makes me sad to hear, and um, and I have some people in my life who kind of mirror that same pattern, and it really can be a serious and life threatening, um, you know, issue if if that's a part of her her profile or or her story. Mm -hmm. Um, then we have a few comments related to the assessments that we did. Um, one person said that they thought the wart seemed to be more accurate for them. Um, and then someone else said that they had a lot of sometimes answers on the survey tool and that they, um, they really need to consider uh, to reconsider their work habits. Okay. Um, I'm glad that those were both um, informative for you. I had a hard time kind of choosing um, which the formal tests. Um, you know, that I wanted us to, to do in the exercise. I wanted something that's going to be pretty easy to score for, to do and score fairly quickly. Um, but I also really like the dimensionality of the wart. Um, obviously, I'm a fan of Dr. Robinson's work and um, book, but I really felt like it captured a lot. And so I hope that even if you kind of fell in that maybe neutral or sometimes kind of zone, um, you know, you may not have a severe issue. You may not be in that yellow or that uh, red zone, but it might still be giving you some cues and clues about um, how to maintain that, you know, things that could be risk factors for you, or maybe thinking about when it is that those sometimes occur. Is there any kind of pattern to when you would say yes, or when you would say sometimes? Mm -hmm. And someone did make a good point about, they said that some of the questions were difficult to answer because um, their responses would have been different before the pandemic during their telecommute status and now different when they're returning to the office. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. As soon as the context changes, um, again, your role, your expectations, your, your daily context, that also could change. So one interesting thing might be, if you can, to fill it out thinking about pre-pandemic or, you know, certain days of the week that you do have to go into the office versus, and then fill it out again, try to have a different hat or lens on and think about what, um, you know, how you might fill it out differently and see how the scores differ. And then that can also provide some clues or cues around, you know, triggers in the environment or things in the other environment that make it easier or make you less inclined to have those kinds of um, thoughts or responses. Mm -hmm. And then, um, other than that, just lots of positive comments. People really appreciated and enjoyed this webinar. Um, and I did as well. So thank you so much. Um, and somebody did ask if they could possibly have contact information for you, um, moving forward. Uh, so I don't, if you would want to provide that, we could also stick it in the email we do out to folks after That's the webinar. Cool. Sure, so you can definitely find me on LinkedIn um, under Lauren Broyles. Um, you can also feel free to email me my personal email address. I, I need to keep this separate from, from work, but my personal email address is my name. So it's Lauren Broyles, L-A-U-R-E-N-B-R-O-Y-L-E-S at gmail.com. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. Again, I'm so anxious to talk to other people about this topic and I really, really appreciate Iretta giving an opportunity. I've, I've worked with Iretta in many different ways for probably over 10 years, I think we determined, um, again, because my own research and practice was in addiction, but um, this is really a personal uh, interest of mine and I really appreciate Iretta 
saying, yeah, we, we'd like to do a webinar on that. That's different. Let's, let's do it. So thank you all for giving me the opportunity to, um, you know, kind of start this conversation. Yeah, definitely. We're so happy to have you. Um, and thank you all for your great questions and comments. Um, and thank you again, uh, Lauren, Dr. Boyles for such a great webinar. Um, we would just like to remind participants that a copy of Dr. Boyle's PowerPoint, along with the recording of today's presentation, will be uploaded to the webinar library located on IRETA's website by early next week. Once we have these resources posted, a link will be sent to all of today's webinar registrants. I now want to remind you of our evaluation and CEU process. You will receive several follow-up emails from us. The first email will include a link to the evaluation and the second email will include a step-by-step -step instructions on how to obtain your CEUs. Please note that it will take up to 48 hours for your CEUs to become available because we have to cross-check your attendance records. We would like to special we would like to specially request that you fill out our evaluation. It should take no more than 2 minutes of your time and it will help us um, with future webinars. Again, we just want to thank everyone for taking time out of your day to participate today. And again, uh, Dr. Boyles, thank you so much. It was so fantastic. If you have any questions at all, please email us. The email address is info at IRETA.org. And with that, I will conclude today's webinar. Thank you so okay. much and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye.